Hey everyone, so this is kind of a catch-up lecture for POS 362 main government. I'm the instructor Rob Glover. Um, this is material we would have normally covered in class. We fell a little bit behind. I want to take advantage of this week in which I'm not going to be here on Friday uh, to give you some time in your schedule to just kind of watch this at, at your own uh, discretion and, and think about some of these topics in relation to the reading that you've done for this week. So we're going to talk about contemporary Maine politics. We're going to take some of these ideas about Maine political culture, things that we've been discussing in the class, and talk about how they're playing out and how they're being challenged in the context of contemporary Maine politics. So first, we're going to talk about uh, contemporary political polarization in the United States. Uh, and then we'll talk about how this plays out in Maine, some of the political polarization we see in the state of Maine, uh, what its sources are, where it originates, uh, and then we'll talk about both policy impacts and electoral impacts of polarization in the state of Maine. So first off, um, Maine's contemporary polarization can really only be understood in the context of the larger polarized political space of the United States. Polarization, when we use that word, we're just talking about divergence between attitudes and preferences of the different political parties. So when we say that parties are polarized, we mean that there's less convergence between them and wider divergence. They are um, operating in a space in which there are fewer areas of policy agreement, there are fewer areas in which bipartisan, uh, meaning both parties uh, 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 compromise and reach middle ground to pursue shared uh, policy goals. And this plays out uh, also in society at large. It plays out in a uh, a discourse in which there is less consensus and less agreement and in which people's political identification becomes uh, more firmly lodged in one party or another. There's fewer people that identify as independents, fewer people that say um, they're centrist, and even some of those that do say that they're independent or centrist, when you look at their policy positions, when you look at what they support in terms of policy, they in fact are not. They like that label, but when they talk about what they stand for, what they believe, it doesn't actually correspond. So this is a trend that has really significantly grown in the United States, um, especially since the uh, 1970s, 1980s. And uh, those who study partisanship talk about a trend of asymmetric polarization, right? So um, I believe this, this chart maps out um, uh, roll call votes in the U.S. House of Representatives, right? Um, and so it's uh, essentially measuring the extent to which members, individual members of Congress, are uh, identifying, you know, solely with their party and voting on the basis of um, their party and not uh, breaking with their party. They're being more um, loyal, more diligent in uh, what we call towing the party line. And we see that that trend has become more pronounced over time, but uh, it is not as pronounced in the uh, liberal camp or democratic camp as it is in the conservative or republican camp. So when we say asymmetric, when there's an asymmetry, it means that one side uh, is not quite equal to the other, right? And this is a trend that, um, in general, uh, analysts of, of uh, partisanship and parties in the United States have said, yeah, really since the 1990s, there has been uh, a digging in and entrenchment of partisan ideas in the Republican Party. And that's translated over to tactics, things like government shutdowns or uh, obstructionism, um, uh, harsh rhetoric uh, employed against the other side, that we haven't seen a corresponding uh, trend within the Democrats. It's not to say that they haven't become polarized too, but it's more pronounced within the Republican Party and on the conservative side. So that's what we're dealing with at the national level. That's kind of the broad, big picture um, uh, scope of, of what polarization looks like in the United States. And you've heard that terminology. If you study politics, you've heard uh, talk about how bipartisanship is dead and we've become so so polarized and you know where is the room for working together, working across the aisle. But it's worth thinking about where this polarization comes from. It doesn't just kind of spring up uh, magically. There are sources of this polarization. So 
in class, we would talk about that a little bit and maybe think about that on your own. Where does party polarization come from? When we talk about polarization at the state level, you have to take a more granular look at, okay, what is playing out um, at the state level? So yes, there are these national trends. There are these national um, uh, variables and factors that are playing into that, but what's happening in the state of Maine? And so we're going to talk about some of those sources of polarization in Maine. All right, so sources of polarization in Maine. Um, we can talk about a number of different things, uh, and we will actually go into every one of these in detail, as you see. So um, the things we're going to talk about are campaign spending and tactics. That can play a role in terms of uh, how polarized you are. Legislative redistricting, meaning what are the geogra geographical boundaries of our legislative districts? How are they drawn and who is within them? And we'll talk about why that matters. Partisan mobilization through organizations and advocacy groups. So we've talked in this class about how Maine has a very dynamic and active um, organizational space, civil society, lots of advocacy groups. Well, those groups, depending on what they look like and whose interests they represent, they can drive polarization. We're going to talk about the media and how the media has evolved and changed over time. And then lastly, we talk about party leadership and prominent party figures. Okay, so campaign spending and tactics. This is an area in which polarization uh, increases mainly through the atmosphere created by political campaigns. So one of the things that national uh, decisions like uh, Buckley versus Vallejo and Citizens United did is it opened up this space for independent expenditures, which are unlimited. Um, outside groups can spend money in, uh, in state elections, for example. And as long as they don't coordinate with the parties or um, the, the campaigns themselves, the candidates, uh, they can they have pretty much free reign and Maine is a, a small state uh, Purchasing you know media and ad time is cheap and so Maine has been an attractive target for independent expenditures and pretty much as soon as we saw these uh, the Citizens United decision in, in particular as soon as we saw that open up this space we've seen a vast increase in outside political spending these independent expenditures so between 2006 and 2010, uh, independent expenditures on the gubernatorial races, the race for governor, increased by 650%. And between 2008 and 2012, legislative independent expenditures increased by 557%. When this independent money comes into a single legislative district, it can entirely change the tone of the race because the candidate does not have control over what mailers being sent out to you know people's doors are are saying or in the case of ad time they they don't have control over the messaging so when i first moved to maine there was a race between um jeff gratwick and nikki farnham in the bangor district that i was living in and I was just getting a lot of mail that was really, really harsh and negative. And what it was was independent expenditures on both sides. Um, for the candidates, uh, Gratwick was a, a clean elections candidate. So he had a very limited amount of money that he could spend, and he wasn't uh, spending it on mailers and things like that. And uh, nevertheless, there was some very negative uh, campaign materials that were being sent out um, in his name, you know, advocating for citizens to vote for Jeff Gratwick that were pretty negative and, and were attacking Nikki Farnham. So um, in 2016, the most recent election, we saw $3.3 million in independent expenditures in Maine legislative races. And that might not seem like a lot. And in some states, it wouldn't be, right? $3.3 million wouldn't be enough to have a significant impact. But as I said, um, Maine is a, a relatively cheap state, and so you can spend, you know, uh, fifty thousand dollars in a single legislative district, and really just kind of inundate voters with material and uh, campaign material that um, that has an impact, and people, um, you know, get get overwhelmed by it. 
We also know from research that negative advertising works, right? People wouldn't continue to engage in negative advertising if it didn't have an impact. And so unfortunately, there's no uh, kind of natural organic incentive to cease this sort of activity. The only thing that would reduce this would be restrictions on these independent expenditures. But as long as they remain legal, and as long as this continues to have an impact, we're going to see this in the state of Maine. And we've seen it just increasingly. Every race, we've seen this independent spending tick up. Okay, So that's going to impact um, polarization. That is going to drive people into more uh, rigid ideolo ideological positions because it shapes the way that we talk about politics and the way that we identify candidates and and their adversaries, their political adversaries. Um, legislative redistricting. So in most states, the legislators themselves are responsible for redistricting. And uh, in Maine, this happens every 10 years, it reflects the census. So every time we do a United States census, usually it's within two or three years, uh, they redraw the legislative districts. So the last time we redrew our legislative districts in Maine was in 2013, and we will eventually do it again um, I believe in 2023, once we do the next census. In Maine, this is a negotiation between the parties, and really it's uh, leadership within the parties. It's a bipartisan uh, special committee that draws up these legislative districts. And increasingly what we're seeing are legislative districts that are, at least in terms of ideology, they're homogenous. They're uh, very, very uh, democratic or very, very Republican. They are constructed geographically in ways that make them appealing for the two parties and safe seats where uh, they're pretty confident that their candidates are going to get elected there. There are very few legislative districts, congressional uh, and Senate districts that are um, flippable, right? That could go, it could bounce back and forth from one party to another. Uh, there's only a handful of seats in Maine that are routinely in play and could go to a Democrat or could go to a Republican or an independent. So that can lead to increased polarization because you end up with uh, candidates getting elected and then being beholden to constituencies which are going to punish them pretty harshly if they do engage in lots of bipartisan compromise. And they do... Um, kind of blur their ideological lines in which uh, in ways which make them less of a hardcore Republican or hardcore Democrat and really more of a more of a centrist pragmatic deal maker right if you have an intensely ideological uh, district either Republican or Democrat it's just harder to um, find the types of candidates that are moderate and centrist and can get elected and then once they're in office, it's harder for them to engage in those forms of moderation. So that can drive polarization as well. Partisan mobilization. So we have seen increasingly since the 1990s um, explicitly partisan policy advocacy organizations in Maine. They have become uh, more effective in terms of raising money, more effective in terms of uh, outreach and communications and the media landscape has really grown up around them in ways that make their jobs easier right so in the early 1990s if you had a policy advocacy organization and you wanted to reach tens of thousands of people you had to put out a mailer and you had to pay to get something delivered to people's homes or you had to um, you know have a phone bank and call people up over the phone and now, increasingly, these organizations, they can do a lot with a fairly uh, nimble and small staff because of social media and because of new changes in communications technology. And they really do have the power to influence policy discussions and discourse right, in ways that they didn't necessarily before. There were a handful of advocacy organizations, but now there's a lot of them. And what we see when we look at some of the most prominent um, advocacy organizations is uh, there's a real absence of um, a middle, right? So, um, for instance, on the left, uh, more progressive organizations, you have uh, Maine People's Alliance or uh, Maine Equal Justice Partners, the Maine Center for Economic Policy. These are avowedly progressive organizations. They support progressive ideals. Uh, they 
uh, in the case of, of Maine People's Alliance, they get um, uh, issues on the ballot that are explicitly progressive and work with coalitions of progressive partners to try and change the political discourse and the political outcomes that we see in the state of Maine. So that's clearly uh, right wing. On the right, you have organizations like the Maine Heritage Policy Center or a national organization um, called the American Legislative Exchange Council, which actually crafts model legislation. They will um, craft you know, a, a bill on, um, for instance, uh, gun control or a bill on uh, corporate taxes at the state level, right? And then they will just circulate that to different legislators and everything that they um, they construct is from a conservative pro-business point of view. They actually sometimes connect business lobbyists with state lawmakers and ALEC, um, the American Legislative Exchange Council, kind of works as the intermediary to craft business-friendly uh, legislation at the state level. And so these organizations represent um, different poles of our ideological space. And so as a result, um, the uh, discourse and the political outcomes that we see uh, kind of follow that path that we saw at the outset. We see more um, kind of migration, ideological migration to the, the far edges and less fewer organizations that really operate in the middle and put together broad bipartisan coalitions. So that too can have an effect on polarization. Speaking of communications technology and media, um, we're operating in a very different media space. So Maine is unique and it's one of the few states in which uh, at least some of our local papers, our you know, state-based papers, remain independently owned. But there is major media ownership by a guy named Donald Sussman. He owns a company called Maine Today Media. He is a major progressive donor, donates millions of dollars to state and progressive causes, and was actually the former husband of Shelley Pingree, um, a progressive uh, congressional rep that represents Maine's first congressional district. So while there is some sort of independent ownership, there's often uh, claims or allegations that because of Donald Sussman's oversized role in the main media landscape that we tend to see uh, a slightly more um, progressive set of of um, media outlets, you know, the daily newspapers, and there's no corresponding media voice on the right to kind of balance that. Once we go online, we see a lot of um, online media outlets with very explicit political agendas, uh, putting out information and trying to shape our political discourse and our, our uh, facts, our information, in ways that align with that. So um, the main wire, for instance, is uh, a kind of online source, a, a blog, really, um, that puts forth really opinionated pieces about main politics and uh, issues before the legislature from a conservative point of view, right? And so you're really you're getting kind of one very opinionated source of information. The main examiner, which we talked about a few weeks ago, is... Um, putting forth anonymous news stories and may actually be directly linked to Jason Savage, who's the executive director of the main uh, main Republican Party, um, and operates from a conservative point of view. It puts out conservative talking points and is really critical of um, progressive ideas. So we have these entities that occupy uh, the right. We also have them from the left, right? So. For instance, Maine People's Alliance, which we mentioned, has a podcast and it has a blog um, called The Beacon. And that is just, that's MPA's communications arm um, doing essentially, you know, kind of from a different ideological perspective, but essentially the same thing that we see with the main wire. Uh, there is also kind of clearing houses of um, information related to Maine politics that operate from a progressive point of view. There's a source called the Maine Progressives Warehouse. It's really um, a blog and there's just a ton of information there, but it's it's clearly from a progressive point of view. So this ties into something we call the narrow cast media, and it's a function of the media landscape that we have today. Essentially, instead of trying to capture as many um, 
viewers as possible. Try to craft your message and craft the types of stories that you cover in a way that you have a broad umbrella. There is now a market for um, really niche markets, right? Like uh, niche constituencies that are looking for a certain type of information that aligns with a certain uh, political perspective. And the danger in that, the danger both in outlets like this and the fact that many of us get our news from uh, social media sources, which are based on algorithms, they show us what we want to see based on likes and previous content that we've viewed, is that we're really uh, deep within an echo chamber. We're in, we're, in a, we're in a structural echo chamber because the type of information that we get, unless we actively seek out divergent perspectives, we're not going to get them. It causes us to be more extreme in our own political positions it also causes us to be less adept at engaging with others when we are presented with viewpoints that we uh, haven't been exposed to on a regular basis we don't understand them and don't understand how to have a kind of engaged civil conversation about them so it impoverishes the political discourse in ways that do in fact circle back into polarization then we have party leadership and, prom and prominent political figures in the state. So politics, especially at the state level, is about relationships. And um, how those relationships go forward really is shaped by the ways that individuals talk about each other in public. Right? So we have seen um, this at the national level with the Trump administration. Trump has a very brash, combative style and he will criticize people that go against him or disagree with him, sometimes on a you know, fairly minor policy issue. He'll criticize people even within his own party. Um, that can sabotage a relationship, and that sort of behavior, especially at the state level, right, where you're dealing with a smaller, a smaller network of political players, can really damage relationships. There's always been, in the state of Maine, uh, kind of pride placed in the fact that even though members of different parties might disagree, they respect one another, they're civil to one another, they will refer to each other with uh, in respectful ways in public settings, even if they disagree uh, really uh, profoundly in private settings. We've seen that start to break down. It was never perfect. We don't want to idealize the past, but particularly in the last 10 years or so, We've seen that really break down. And a lot of that is who we have in the Blaine House, right? Uh, Governor LePage has a pretty brash style. He'll come out swinging at people. He's criticized members of his own party. He's uh, really harshly criticized members of the Democratic Party. And um, it's led to fracture not only within the institutions between Republicans and Democrats, but also internal fracture, right? So... Um, prominent Republicans openly questioning LePage's leadership or um, LePage deciding that uh, he's going to criticize the legislature and not uh, submit a, a budget to the legislature and members of legislative leadership from his own party saying, okay, then we're going to work around you. We're not going to include you in the process. So there's some instances in which LePage's style has resulted in him um, getting wins and really kind of digging in and succeeding in what he wanted to achieve. But in a lot of cases, it's meant that uh, other institutions of government and actors kind of try to work around him. He also has, um, 2016 is a little bit of an exception, but leading up to that race, he had provided very little support for Republican legislative races. Normally the governor is out there uh, on the campaign trail trying to drum up uh, support and, and fundraising and, and you know he's uh, cam campaigning out at public events with candidates for some of these legislative races trying to help them ensure that they win and we haven't really seen that uh, or we've seen it on a more selective basis in the case of Paula Page. Now that's not to suggest that it's just the Republican Party that suffered this internal fracture the Democrats as well, I think, in the state of Maine are pretty split. And there's a split between uh, the kind of far wing of the Democratic Party and really, I mean, we can say the Bernie Sanders camp, people that either openly supported Bernie Sanders in 2016 or support the type of policies that would traditionally be associated with uh, 
a social democrat like Bernie Sanders, and the more mainstream centrist uh, Democrats that would be more comfortably in the Hillary Clinton camp. Uh, Maine broke pretty hard for Bernie in the lead up to the um, Democratic National Convention, um, especially some of the urban areas, you know, especially some of the more populated areas. The Democrats in those areas were out in droves uh, supporting uh, Bernie Sanders. And he also brought a lot of people into the party that hadn't necessarily been there before. Lots of young people, lots of people who weren't really interested in politics were brought in. And there's a pretty intense split happening there, which is, it's linked to that broader polarization, right? People have dug in at the far edges of the ideological spectrum, and they're going to punish those who try to operate in the middle, try to be more centrist in their approach. So we have a lot of ways in which polarization has played out in the state of Maine. And I think the key thing I want you to understand is that it, it doesn't come uh, magically down from the sky. This is a product of changes in um, institutions, changes in political leadership, changes in our media landscape, national level changes regarding campaign finance that have filtered down to the state level and are shaping how uh, money impacts politics in the state of Maine. And all of that is going to drive this political polarization. So Maine, a state that has traditionally provided itself uh, traditionally prided itself on being bipartisan and primed for compromise is really struggling to maintain that. So let's talk about some of the implications of political polarization. So on a policy level, um, I think we could say that the last legislative session and really the last several legislative sessions have exposed some deep ideological divides um, we've seen increased use of referendums, and largely that's because uh, members of the party, uh, members of um, both parties, are demanding uh, changes to the law and reforms and uh, various types of changes that the legislature is unwilling uh, or unable to produce any sort of outcome on. This is really ramped up in the wake of Governor LePage uh, and his use of the veto. He does not hesitate to use the veto if he disagrees with something, even if it has really, really strong uh, bipartisan support in the legislature, he will veto it. And so the referendum uh, has been used as a workaround for some of these issues in which uh, LePage has just consistently vetoed legislation that has gone through the legislature and passed. But you look at any of these issues, um, many of which actually have been uh, both efforts in the legislature and then eventually uh, they have been uh, issues that were considered through referendums. And we've seen intense fights in Augusta over this. Medicaid expansion, uh, education funding, gun rights, right? We had a referendum on um, expanding background checks and closing some, some loopholes for um, uh, background checks, which um, there was a lot of... Uh, kind of debate back and forth about this. There's public, uh, public opinion research that su suggests that most Americans, most gun owners actually approve of some of these changes. Uh, but there's a lot of pushback on this. Um, marijuana legalization, alternative energy, all of these issues have produced legislation or produced referendums and citizens initiatives in the last several years that have really exposed rifts in uh, both the general public and uh, those within the legislature and the governor. So we have also this tension between branches. As I said, the governor is using veto power in an unprecedented way. He is smashing records for vetoes and um, hasn't really slowed down at all. I, I suspect we'll continue to see that this legislative session, that there will be lots of things that the legislature will pass and the governor will veto and they may not go forward because they might not have the number of votes that they need to override that veto. So increasingly the challenge for legislators is not just passing legislation, which is hard. You know, there's a torturous path to legislation uh, coming into law that you're going to get to see, but it's also finding legislators that are willing to override the governor's veto. This boils down even to um, uh, changes that have happened at 
the executive agency level. So we'll get into this a bit more when we talk about the executive branch and how the governor organizes his power uh, and the entities that he has control over within the state. But as you know, I suspect, there's a number of government agencies that are kind of within the purview of the governor. So Department of Health and Human Services, Department of Labor, Department of Environmental Protection, Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. And one of the things that has been interesting to watch and is also symptomatic of this broader policy polarization uh, or political polarization that we see is uh, the ways in which the executive branch has tried to change the nature of those uh, state agencies or shuffle around um, you know the the um, the resources and the personnel that they have at their disposal uh, the state planning office used to be the state of Maine's kind of big picture macro level uh, entity that would engage in economic planning and that was actually done away with by Governor LePage. One of his uh, efforts when he first came in as governor was to engage in co consolidation of some of these state agencies and do away with agencies or um, staff within agencies that he viewed as irrelevant or unnecessary or he sometimes changed the character of um, the agency away from it's perhaps its original mission to something else. So that too, it's not just what happens in the legislature. It's not just uh, you know pushing legislation forward and then trying to get the votes you need to uh, override the veto if the governor vetoes it. And the governor actually has a substantial realm of um, power over things like um, I don't know appointments to uh, board of trustees of the University of Maine system, for example, or how he staffs his um, his various agencies, what types of people he puts into uh, positions in his his state agencies, in a sa in kind of a similar way to what uh, Trump was doing with um, cabinet appointments, right? He was signaling uh, that he wanted to pursue a certain set of policies just by the nature of the people he was putting in these positions. And Paula Page has done the same thing as governor of Maine. So that's a more subtle way in which this polarization can play out in terms of policy. It's just at the agency level. All right. Electoral implications. We kind of already went over this with when we're talking about campaign, uh, campaign finance and some of the independent expenditures. But, um, I think the biggest change that we've seen is that traditionally uh, races and campaign advertising, it was really tended to be civil and tended to be informational. It was designed to get out information to voters about candidates has started to look like the campaign ads uh, and the campaign discourse that we see at the national level, which is to say lots of negative advertising, a lot of money. So there's more advertising. There's a greater volume of advertising and communications efforts than there used to be. And really, this has resulted in levels of campaign spending um, largely from independent expenditures that we've never seen before in Maine. One of the byproducts of this that we'll talk about later in the course is that it has introduced complications with the state's um, clean elections laws, where if you're a clean elections candidate, uh, you have certain restrictions on uh, how much money you can spend, money that you can get from uh, outside sources and donations, and um, so you kind of operate within a budget, right? And usually, for the purposes of most races, prior to floods of independent expenditures, it's a perfectly sufficient budget for a main state senate race or a main house race. But if you're in a targeted district and some outside entity really wants to see their candidate win in your district and they flood your district with money, you're all of a sudden at a disadvantage. And so one of the things that um, the state has, has struggled to do since the influx of outside money, to, money is think about ways that they could revamp our clean elections public funding system to counter that. So... In a uh, piece by Howard Cody, my former colleague, uh, still a professor emeritus here at UMaine, he was remarking on some of these changes over the last decade or so in Maine politics. And he summed it up pretty well, I thought. He said, if Maine's new normal legitimates attack advertising and a rejection of collegial policymaking, its traditional political culture, deeming politics as constructive and politics as honorable will suffer. Perhaps this process is already underway. He wrote this a few years ago. 
Um, and I think that's true. I think that if the um, political landscape in Maine begins to resemble what we've seen at the national level, then all this reverence, all of this pride that we see about public service and uh, our citizen legislature and the level of access that citizens have to their policymakers, levels of participation that we see in the state of Maine, um, that could suffer. You know, these sorts of, of uh, changes to the culture eventually manifest themselves in how people engage with politics. And in a way, a state that's as open and has as much access, as much participation, uh, it's uh, s- small in scope and, um, and not, you know, a New York or a, a Florida or an Illinois, um, but a, a small, tightly knit political network is vulnerable to these sorts of outside forces and these polarizing trends and can really be upset by them, can potentially be um, damaged irreparably. So when you talk about uh, politics in Maine and you talk to people who have been closely following Maine politics for a long time, there is this kind of mourning for something that we've lost and a real concern about the future as to whether this polarization is going to shift Maine politics into some other realm which will produce different types of policy, different behavior by policymakers, and really a different character of state politics altogether. So um, this is something to think about. This is something we would have talked about in class, but uh, based on what we've discussed so far, do you think this is a, a kind of a blip on the radar screen? It's driven by some s- exceptional factors, uh, and maybe main politics is a little more durable uh, than than some would seem to make it. Or do you think that this polarization is is kind of an inevitable wave that will impact main state politics and will change the character of our um, political culture in this state going forward? That's just something to think about and. Uh, maybe we'll come back to that at the end of this class after you've been exposed to uh, more of the, the nuts and bolts and how the process works. But an important thing to come away from this class being able to answer, to have a position on this question of whether or not our polarization is, is Maine's new normal. Okay, so for next class, uh, we're going to start to dig into the different branches of government in the state of Maine. Uh, We primarily focus in this class on the state legislature uh, and the executive branch, the governor and then his various entities through which he uh, uh, carries out policy. So we start with state legislatures, and I actually have you read from a book that's not about main state politics or the main state legislature specifically, but tries to give you um, a broad comparative perspective on state legislatures in the United States. So um, you're reading two chapters from a book called Politics Under the Domes uh, by Squire and Moncrief. Uh, It's kind of the standard, if you took a a state politics class that was looking beyond, you know, just the state of Maine, this is one of the standard texts that you would read. So you're reading the first two chapters that talk about um, how the institutions uh, vary from one state to another and some of the salient ways in which they differ and also um, who runs and serves in state legislatures. So I want you to think about, um, one, how do state legislatures differ from the U.S. Congress in their character and their operations? So many of you, your point of reference for how a legislature works is probably what happens in the House of Representatives and and, uh, the Senate, the U.S. Senate. Um, But I want you to think about um, how the state legislative operations differ um, because they're doing some of the same functions. They're crafting policy, but they're doing so in a really different environment with different resources and different types of people serving in these positions. So that's the first thing to think about. The other thing I would encourage you to ponder a little bit is some of the most striking ways in which legislatures and legislators, the people that uh, occupy state legislatures, differ from state to state. You'll see there are some interesting ways in which uh, these institutions vary, uh, sometimes pretty wildly from one state to another. And um, I talked at the outset of the class about how states can operate as laboratories of democracy. And this is one of the clearest places in which you see it. So uh, I'll wrap up there. Everybody enjoy the rest of your week. Have a great weekend. And I'll catch up with you uh, when I'm back from Baltimore on Monday. Thanks.